Um, welcome to the GIC virtual briefing. I'm Kathleen Stephenson, Vice Chair of the GIC College of Central Bankers. And today's topic is central bank independence. Now, to help us parse through this uh, concept, which at first sight seems pretty straightforward and easy, but at the end of the day, it is quite a complex and nuanced type of uh, topic. So we are, have the honor to be joined by three distinguished speakers, Athanasios Orf Orfanides, Anthony Santomero, and Patrick Honahan. I am um, being mindful, actually, of time. Let me just very briefly introduce our speakers. Um, you have their bios, actually, in uh, the webinar announcement that was uh, sent out to you. Athanasio served as governor of uh, the Central Bank of Cyprus from 2007 to 2012 and was a member of the governing council of the European Central Bank. And he's currently a professor of global economics and management at the MIT Sloan School of um, um, Management. Anthony Santomero served as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia from 2000 to 2006 and has a lengthy academic career at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a professor of finance at the Wharton School of Business. And Patrick Honahan served as the governor of Central Bank of uh, Ireland from uh, 2009 to 2015. And as a result of that, was also a member of uh, the governing council of the ECB. Uh, two important events for Patrick. Uh, one is happy belated birthday. I think your birthday was yesterday. And uh, also his new book by the, the Central Bank as Crisis Manager was just published by the Peterson Institute of International Economics and the Columbia University Press. Congratulations, Patrick. So the way we're going to um, uh, set this uh, webinar is uh, Athanasios will uh, be making some opening remarks and he will share his slides, and then it will be followed by um, discussion uh, from both um, Tony and uh, Patrick. So at the moment, I will invite Athanasios to um, essentially get going with your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and my role here is going to be to uh, to simply introduce uh, the uh, uh, the topic with a uh, uh, with a few slides that I will that I will be sharing and uh, the, the issue we're discussing central bank uh, independence uh, is of course not a new issue and one of the things I want to do to start the issue with is highlight why we're discussing this issue why we're discussing the challenges and and also link this to to the fact that uh, it's it's a discussion that has been going on for for at least a couple of centuries. And I, I thought it would be useful to start from, uh, from a classic paper uh, uh, written um, in 1962 originally by Milton Friedman, questioning uh, whether uh, central banks uh, uh, should be independent and whether this is the best institutional uh, arrangement we have for uh, uh, controlling uh, money. And this is a quote setting up the... Uh, um, uh, the study that uh, that Friedman uh, published back then, as he highlighted, the institutional challenge is to establish an arrangement that will uh, enable government to exercise this, the responsibility for money, yet at the same time limit the power thereby given to government and prevent the power from being used in ways that will tend to weaken rather than strengthen a free society. Of course, we are all familiar with the challenge of, uh, uh, of controlling uh, money. The most predominant challenge over the centuries has been to avoid misusing the power of the printing press, uh, of financing uh, governments. Uh, that potential for misuse goes back millennia. 
And, and this is really the key reason uh, that justifies uh, the independence of the central bank. And indeed, you know, in, in my view, it's a very good institutional arrangement to have an independent central bank in order to be able to preserve price stability over time and control the urge that, uh, that political authorities would inevitably have uh, if left on their own devices. Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to print money and finance projects. This indeed uh, was recognized at least two centuries ago, uh, and uh, I, I will I will refer you to David Ricardo's book. Uh, this was a book he he uh, he wrote, uh, uh, trying to advise uh, uh, the British government at the time about how to improve the institutional arrangements of the Bank of England. And and he highlighted in this uh, in this uh, in this in this book the dangers of uh, of entrusting governments uh, with the power of, of issuing money. And clearly, in his view, the solution that he saw uh, already uh, two hundred years ago uh, was uh, that uh, the Bank of England and any central bank should be independent in order to control, uh, as he says the great dangers, that is to say, of the ministers uh, them, were themselves to be entrusted with the power of issuing money. The problem is has been the same uh, over the centuries. Uh, whenever someone controls the printing press, the urge is there to finance uh, uh, the needs. This is the separation of having the spending ministers always want to find money to spend and some authority that will limit that urge to uh, as ensure price stability over time, as we know now, and this is something that has been recognized over time, uh, is the best way to uh, uh, to promote growth uh, uh, in, and uh, uh, and employment in in a free in a free society. Without pr price stability, everything else falls apart. So this is the main justification for the independence of uh, of central banks, and yet. Uh, we also need to examine the challenges that come with uh, uh, with that. I started with uh, with Milton Friedman's 1962 uh, um, uh, essay, and I will I will uh, give you a, a, one example of the concerns that uh, uh, that Milton Friedman uh, had expressed at the time, which at the end of the day actually convinced him that a central bank independence was not the best way to. Um, to promote uh, uh, price stability over time. Uh, the conclusion in, uh, in Milton Friedman's essay was that the best way to preserve price stability of, of the, uh, over time is to establish a monetary rule that would be designed so as to preserve price stability. Why did he reach that conclusion? He reached that conclusion because he was concerned that uh, if uh, an independent central bank is established, we still have to deal with this unfortunate uh, uh, element uh, in, in human affairs that we need people to run this independent central bank. And uh, we may not be able to ensure that the people in charge of the central banks will be behaving uh, responsibly at all times. In particular, what he pointed out, as you, as you can see in this quote, is that when we have an independent central bank, and that central bank also has a lot of leeway and power about how it interprets its mandates, then inevitably uh, the outcomes that we will get will be highly independent or personalities. And over the over the centuries, we are familiar with uh, with behavior biases, with political pressures, uh, with other flaws that are inevitable in human affairs that uh, can lead to the inappropriate use of discretion by uh, political uh, institutions. So this is what is leaving us really with this question. What is the best arrangement? By my view, an independent central bank focused on a price stability mandate is the best arrangement, but we need to find a way to address Milton Friedman's concerns about the inappropriate use of discretion uh, and then dependence on personalities. And indeed, when I reflect back on, on the last um, uh, couple of decades, when we have seen, especially since the global financial crisis, uh, questioning uh, of the independence uh, of central banks, uh, actually, I actually see uh, the elements that lead to this questioning of, of independence. 
as, as feeding from, from Milton Friedman's uh, concerns. What has been happening? And let me give you just a few thoughts to start the discussion uh, down the road. First, uh, uh, in the post-pandemic experience, we have seen a pretty major lapse uh, of a number of central banks around the world, virtually all, not all, but virtually all advanced economy central banks uh, in defending price stability. And this is something that was um, uh, predictable in real time. Uh, those of us observing central banks, we saw that a number of central banks failed to adhere to systematic uh, policy, especially, I'm going to say, in 2021, a major policy mistake by, by central banks uh, uh, waiting too long for, for withholding, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, uh, reverse the accommodation that was absolutely necessary during the pandemic, uh, ignoring uh, robust policy rules that were already suggesting for tightening uh, of monetary policy. And clearly, this has created a lot of unhappiness and backlash uh, against uh, central banks. The second element actually goes back all the way to the global financial crisis, the balance sheet expansion that we have seen, like if, if we like, if we take the Federal Reserve, its balance sheet uh, peaked at something that was almost ten times uh, the size it had before the uh, global financial uh, crisis, and the projection of fiscal powers associated with the balance sheet expansion. Now, balance sheet expansion was necessary, uh, in my view. Uh, when uh, central banks were hampered uh, by by the effective lower bound on interest rates, but it was also uh, inappropriately used when central banks expanded their balance sheets too much beyond what's necessary uh, to avoid uh, deflation and accommodating, unfortunately, uh, as we saw in the last um, uh, three years, uh, a bout of inflation that could have otherwise uh, been avoided. But beyond that, we have other questions that raise the legitimacy issues of, of using central bank uh, independence. Uh, we have seen this on, 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 a, on a number of occasions in recent years. I will just mention one example that is, uh, that is quite pressing, the role of uh, central banks uh, uh, in greening the economy. I mean, I, I, I think we can all agree on the importance of protecting the, the environment and dealing with this major threat that we have. Uh, but uh, one can ask the question, what is the legitimate use of central bank resources and discretionary authority in fixing these problems? Uh, so when we see cases where central banks are using uh, their authority on regulatory matters, for example, to create distortions uh, in, uh, in investment decisions, that is not the best uh, economic advice uh, that, uh, that an economic advisor would offer on how to handle climate change. And yet we see some central banks uh, promoting uh, policies like this. And in, in, my, uh, in my view, this is one example that actually raises legitimacy questions on the use of discretionary authority and makes people ask, why do we give so much independence to central banks with unchecked uh, power? And, and I'm going to end with the with a, with a thought on how important transparency and accountability are if we want to preserve over time and promote central bank independence, which in my view would be desirable over time. Some central banks avoid transparency, some, some central banks avoid accountability, and frankly, there is no way to defend central bank independence without full transparency and accountability of their actions and without a mechanism that would limit discretionary authority to ensure that policies will be systematic over time, focus on defending price stability and minimizing the fiscal uh, footprint uh, and, and uh, involvement in other, uh, in other respects. So this is where I'm going to end. I just wanted to, to lay out the land so we can have a lively discussion. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Athanasius. And indeed, I think that there is a lot here to be discussed and uh, I'll turn it to uh, Tony for uh, some of his remarks and then we'll move on to Patrick and then we can, you know, have everybody, you know, in joining in. Tony? My, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, I, I guess my remarks continue along the same line. 
continue as opposed to stop where Athanasius started. Um, what we're what we're hearing, which I agree with, is that central banking is part of the political process. It's a creature of the political process. What it should do, what it should have as a mandate, we can discuss. But the reality is central banks exist. They've existed for some time. And the mandate is given from the government as, a, as part of this political process of balancing vested interests. We have the technical issues as a central bank of trying to deliver in our charge. Sorry, the, my phone is going off. I, just, I guess there's there someone complaining about the central bank. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, the, um, the technical issues which we have are how to deliver on these mandates. Now, these mandates can come in ver various ways. The, the cleanest mandate is price stability. But as we know in the United States, there are other mandates. We have a dual mandate of maximum employment as well as price stability. In both the UK and in the Scandinavian countries, they added financial stability. It's now quite common for it to come as a mandate for the central bank. And in addition, as, as was just pointed out, we have recently added others such as climate change, a green economy and the like. Now, what this does is create a problem. Because at the end of the day, while the central bank is powerful, it is limited. And uh, some years ago, I wrote an article about what central banks can and can't do. The, as we know, the central bank provides liquidity in the system, and that liquidity uh, adds to the economic activity in appropriate ways or inappropriate ways if it's badly provided. In addition, the central bank has a stability responsibility increasingly in today's world of global financialist systems. These two things are important, but they're not all powerful. There may be more objectives that are given to the central bank than can be delivered by the central bank. I'm reminded of the mid-last century conversation about tools and targets. If we're told to do 18 things and given one or two tools, we will inevitably fail at that. And we will therefore get back into the political process where some people think we are not delivering on what is mandated. So going back to the earlier theme, I think the notion of having a limited focus mandate makes sense. There's a second issue that is important, and the issue of time. There's a time element in what we do. What we do as central banks does not immediately affect the economy with a zero lag and an instantaneous output. And the net result is that short-term action cause longer-term effects. And the reputation of the central bank is an important part of this process. As it enters the economy, as it enters the financial market and takes action, the markets and the economy in, uh, at large has to believe that those actions will come through to have a positive effect on the economy. The success of the central bank is dependent upon this reputational effect. It must be considered when central banks take action. And we must realize that the broader our mandate, the broader the goals we accept, the more difficult it is to maintain a good reputation because someone is always complaining about you're not doing enough on their particular objective. So at the end of the day, I would argue that we have to be very careful as central bankers to narrowly focus on what we do to be more technocrats than politicians, to focus in on what is doable and what can be shown to result from our actions. Otherwise, this process will start again and the politicians will reconsider their mandate and will land up as part of a larger treasury, considering all the objectives of policy. And with that, I'll turn to Patrick. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, Patrick, um, you you will say a few remarks, but I also, if I may, uh, I would very much like to hear a couple of words uh, 
um, about the book that you just uh, uh, published. Uh, since it is part of central banking anyways, um, it would be nice for you to share it uh, with us. Oh, well, just a sentence or two. Thanks very much. I'm uh, sort of pumped up about this because the book was published yesterday and it's always a long wait until the book gets published. And um, th in that book, and it's not, not focused on our issue of today, it, it, I start with the, the observation that uh, everybody is trying to prevent the next financial crisis and there are all sorts of measures adopted, some, some of them better than others, by central banks and others to, to um, limit the risks that are being taken and the, ensure that, that uh, prudence is observed. But these things don't last and there are failures. And I think that what, we, what I wanted to write about was how should central banks deal with the next financial crisis when it breaks out and how should they be preparing themselves now, uh, given that there will be another financial crisis? I'm not saying in in days. I'm not saying in months. But there will. We know they come. They come around. And uh, so uh, that that's that that's the theme of my book. Looking looking back at a number of crises that have happened in advanced economies, the most advanced economies, and in emerging economies over the last few years, um, and, and and focusing on on what we can learn lessons from that. But but let me get back to the um, the question this uh, question of independence that's been so um, well developed by Athanasios and um, Tony, and I want to 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 look a bit um, maybe take a slightly uh, different angle looking at it. Uh, how do you preserve independence? We all agree that independence is important. But how do you preserve as a central bank independence? Uh, you might say, well, get it into legislation and that's all right. If it's, if it's if there's legislation that says the central bank is independent, you're all right. Well, that's not very realistic. Um, legislation can be changed. Uh, if, in the United States, it's Congress, it's the administration, they don't always find it easy to change legislation. In other countries, legislation quite easily changed by a powerful government. Um, and that's not the, the only thing uh, that legislation can be changed. But legislation can be bypassed by indirect measures. Um, you know, okay, you, maybe the central bank is independent, but if you have appointed the governor and the senior staff as political supporters of the government, then hasn't the government controlled or hoped that it contro has controlled the, the central bank? Um, so who, who you appoint can limit the independence the practical independence of the central bank. And there are all sorts of other ways that governments can squeeze a central bank, even while complying with the letter of the law on independence. So I would think it's very important to uh, look at independence as a dynamic uh, issue that central banks, if they want to remain securely independent, they must look to the trust and reputation that they have built among the general public. If the general public wants the central bank's independence to continue because they value the stability that a central bank can provide, then governments will be reluctant and hesitant to interfere in the direct or indirect ways. Um, so I believe that this issue of trust and reputation is one that should be always to the forefront of central banks if they want to protect their independence. Uh, now, trust in central banks was it, it was knocked. It, it, it took a hit in the global financial crisis or the Atlantic financial crisis, as like some people like to to um, uh, to call it. Especially people in parts of the world that weren't as severely affected, um, they recovered to some extent. Trust in central banks recovered to some extent largely because of the energetic recovery measures that were adopted by the, the central banks uh, after the global financial crisis broke. They didn't recover fully. If you look at surveys, they didn't recover fully. But there's some, some recovery. And indeed, that those energetic re recovery actions tended to create a, a, an exaggerated uh, impression of the power of central banks. Central banks seem to be able to do anything. They could produce vast quantities of money. And that has had consequences for, for us more recently. That's the global financial crisis. 
But there have been several more recent knocks to central bank uh, credibility, central trust and, and the reputation of central banks. The, the inflation surge, um, Athanasio and Tony have, have referred to this. Uh, look, it's clear that it's clear to us now that it would have been very difficult for central banks to prevent that surge, but they didn't. They didn't flag that in advance. They didn't warn the general public that, oh, well, if there's a very severe supply shock such as a COVID, or if there are great unexpected shifts in demand, as we saw following COVID, a shift towards the demand for, for manufacturers uh, when, when services were not available, creating supply blockages, we can't prevent inflation. They didn't say that in advance, and so they have lost a reputation. People said, well, you said you wanted independence to keep monetary stability. Where's the monetary stability? Now they're they're recovering again. The, the, the inflation is down uh, substantially, but uh, there's definitely been a knock to their reputation. And there's another dimension which, depending on the, your country, it may have got more or less attention. It, it, and I'm talking about central bank losses, financial losses in their, in their profit and loss account. Uh, we saw in Switzerland huge losses in 2022 as the they had bought huge quantities of, of foreign exchange in order to um, to prevent their currency appreciating too much. And they experienced really, really large losses. Less obvious because accounted in a different way, substantial losses of the Federal Reserve System in the United States. Big losses by the Bank of England's operations, which have influenced discussions about how much the new government in Britain can spend in its in its forthcoming budget. Um, I think attention will grow and grow on these losses as more and more people become aware of them. And so this is a, these are this is another example of the uh, damaging loss of reputation that central banks can suffer and they they must uh, be sure to not just dismiss these concerns, but to explain clearly, as Athanasius has said, uh, account, accountability and transparency, explain clearly and, and, um, and take the appropriate actions. The most important, complicated issue is this question of additional um, implicit mandates, such as climate change and, and, and also inequality. People talked a lot about inequality in the period after the global financial crisis when central banks were working very hard to lower interest rates, thereby creating uh, substantial capital gains for people holding long-term long -term assets. Um, as the other two speakers today have emphasized, it's quite risky and in, in fact not justified for central banks to make extravagant, take extravagant actions going well beyond what governments would want them to do or what the general public would want them to do uh, on, on these actions. Nevertheless, all of the central banks have Im either explicitly or implicitly secondary mandates to support the general economic policies of the countries they're in. That's true in the European Union. They often said the European Union is super independent, written into the treaty, not just in legislation. Um, and it's focused entirely on price stability. Not exactly true. Price stability is its primary goal, but it also has a secondary goal to um, to promote the uh, overall objectives of the European Union. So what about climate change? And it has been a hot topic um, with extreme actions advocated by some people. And central banks have started to talk about climate change. They've started to use climate change in their regulatory policies to the extent that they have. Many like the Federal Reserve, the ECB have, uh, they, they regulate banks. Uh, this, I think, is inevitable and essential that the central banks do not distance themselves from public opinion, from government, uh, wide government goals. If central banks just say, uh, as the former governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman, in the years gone by, he used to say when he heard any sort of criticism or commentary, he said, the dogs bark, but the caravan must move on. Central banks cannot adopt that kind of none of our business approach to vital public policies. When they take actions such as buying bonds, which they do, 
uh, or have done, maybe not just at the moment, but buying bonds in the time of, of low interest rates, um, they have decisions to take. Um, will they apply a, a climate filter? Will they say, uh, we're not going to buy any bonds of coal producing companies? Uh, these are sort of decisions that are day to day practical decisions, and they have to be able to justify their action, their their actions, uh, and explain clearly. This is the issue of transparency and accountability. So I, I think that the issue is quite complex, political, as Tony said, and um, it's nuanced. I, I, I'm certainly not advocating an aggressive approach of central banks in areas which are not part of their primary mandate and which. Um, it's unrealistic. They, they cannot achieve very much in the area of um, of uh, climate change, for example. Expectations have to be managed. But I don't think it's a distraction. I think it's something they do have to pay attention to in order to retain the independence that allows them to be focused on uh, price stability. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Patrick. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, I have a few questions I know the audience have, but before that, um, I would very much like to hear what both Athanasios and uh, Anthony, uh, Tony, sorry, um, have to um, comment on uh, Patrick's uh, um, observations on independence. Uh, if I may, Kathleen, yes, it's, uh, I, I, I will just make one point uh, where I saw that uh, uh, Tony and I were in agreement of the narrower interpretation of the mandate. Uh, and I want to say that, uh, in my view, uh, this is uh, this is not in disagreement with a, a very important point Patrick emphasizes, with which I agree with, that uh, central banks need to be listening uh, to the public. They need to try to help uh, the debate with better policies. The risk is not to overpromise, not to uh, uh, suggest that, uh, that central banks are all powerful and have the legitimacy to use their discretionary authority uh, in ways that clearly are not legitimate for them to use. And let me give you an example relating to the issue of, uh, uh, of, of climate change. Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, I think climate change is one of the most important long-term challenges uh, of, uh, of our times, uh, uh, where we need very solid uh, uh, economic uh, uh, policies uh, in order to efficiently uh, deal with this thing. But what do we see? Uh, we see some central banks that uh, uh, try to use their discretionary authority on regulatory matters or on the implementation of monetary policy to claim that uh, they are helping uh, in this regard by distorting uh, the collateral frameworks of the implementation of, of monetary policy. Uh, for example, by accepting some assets, but not accepting other assets, by having different uh, haircuts and so forth, which is clearly a very inefficient and suboptimal way uh, to go about it. And just seems, in my view, in some cases, just, just creates a... Uh, the uh, the illusion that uh, that with PR moves such as this, the central bank can gain credibility without really being effective, or even worse than that, by distorting the regulatory framework, suggesting capital charges on some issues than others, and so forth, that really have very little to do with safeguarding financial stability, which should be the primary objective of, of regulation. Now, does that mean that central banks should not be uh, doing something in this regard? In my view, no, it does not mean that. In my view, this is one of the issues where central banks should be acting in their capacity as a trusted policy advisor to governments, uh, as, as, the, as the body that can use technocratic knowledge, as, uh, as Tony highlighted, to offer what is the best known policy advice to tackle the issue. I'll give you an example again with this with this thing with something with a challenge like uh, like climate change. Uh, now, in, in my understanding is that the best uh, way we can deal with it in terms of a uh, of a public finance perspective is with Pigouvian taxes, and uh, I think it would be much better if central banks explained to political authorities that yep, 
This is how we study economics. We actually do have a solution from public finance. Uh, carbon taxes are actually a very efficient way that can solve the problem and then explain that to the public so that we, we adopt a, an efficient solution going forward instead of pretending that by by using their discretionary authorities to change the collateral framework or capital charges and so forth, they are doing something uh, something beyond that. So I want to highlight this issue about what are the limits and how it should be done, uh, in my view. Uh, I will mention one more thing on the um, uh, on the losses uh, that that um, several, uh, uh, again, advanced economy central banks have incurred. This is an example of uh, the importance of warning uh, the uh, uh, the public uh, uh, of uh, uh, of uh, outcomes that may not be the best outcome that, that may come out, come down the road in my view the federal reserve has handled this better than some other central banks um, uh, in two ways first of all already more than a decade ago uh, while uh, it was doing quantitative easing uh, it did issue a number of technical studies explaining to the public that uh, if quantitative easing was overdone, there was a risk that it was experienced losses, that there were some fiscal implications associated with this, but that this was still the best way to proceed with policy in order to ensure price stability and full employment uh, uh, over time. So in that sense, the, the Fed prepared uh, the public for the possibility of, uh, of losses. Uh, what the Fed has not done uh, uh, in uh, in the last couple of years, however, is take responsibility for the fact that it made a policy mistake going back uh, 2021, early 2022. It overexpanded the balance sheet beyond that this was necessary. It actually let uh, uh, prices and inflation rise beyond what could have been controlled, and this actually added to the uh, to the losses uh, that are now um, uh, hidden uh, in the Fed's uh, in the Fed's uh, balance sheet relative to what have been, would have been done with uh, with better policy. There's much that we can respond and <laughs> talk about with uh, Patrick's comment and follow ups. Um, I think the distinction we're making is what central banks can do and what central bankers ought to do. And the distinction being what we can do is a technical matter given our charge and our mandate in the political process and what we can do in, a, in an advisory capacity and an open-minded discussion about how things work, what is possible, what isn't, what needs to get done and who needs to do it. And in that regard, I, I think we're all in agreement that being open about what can be done is important. To limit the charge of, an, of a non-political entity that is mandated and created by a political process is important. But advising the, the central bank, excuse me, the central government, about what is important and then advising the public about implications of economic activity and policy decision is equally important. So I'm all in favor of the advisory function, but we don't want to get into a position where we have too many mandates and our credibility goes to hell in a handbasket. So isn't there a tension here between the fact that you know you if you have too wide a mandate you lose the credibility if you have a very narrow mandate just uh, as uh, for example what um, athanasius was uh, uh, quoting uh, friedman establish a monetary rule uh, to what extent then your hands are tied particularly when you look at that this is one question um if uh, the you have circumstances beyond uh, national control, um, such as the pandemic, um, you know, it, it, the central bank has to move. And the assessment as to whether it should move immediately or as, and I think, um, Athanasius, you mentioned, they should have. They were behind the curve by not moving um, to, to, uh, to, uh, to soon. Um, or the assessment of 
this impact, let's say, of inflation, whether it is transitory or not. So there is clearly a tension here. And this brings me back to a question about trust. To what extent in a politically divisive scenario where we that we find ourselves at the moment, where we have one part harping on negative elements of the central bank and the others kind of defending how can you how can you get the trust of the public uh, when this is happening i mean i think that central banks tend to be caught between uh, this turmoil or within this turmoil and i think it's very hard as a result of that to um to establish the trust even if there is transparency Pat, you want to, Patrick, you want to start? Um, well, I could take it in different dimensions. I think one one dimension that's quite interesting at the moment um, is the 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 question, the normalization that most uh, of the countries that experience inflation are are hoping for and going through. Uh, to what extent, looking at the performance of the economy beyond price stability matters. It does, to, to put it in, in blunt terms, between the European Central Bank, which only is supposed, it, it's, it's, it, 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 there's no explicit mention of unemployment or employment or the economy, is just price stability, and then with a very much secondary other other policies, other support other policies. Whereas in the in the U.S., the Federal Reserve is supposed to consider uh, employment issues as well. Does it make any difference? Do the behavior of uh, uh, does the behavior of, of each of those central banks reflect a difference in their mandate? And with the more um, broad mandate of the Federal Reserve, does that protect their independence better than the than the Euro- European Central Bank? My view is that any central banker will take a sufficiently long view to be prepared to see. Uh, dips in employment when you need to bring the inflation back and slight excesses, as we've seen in in, uh, inflation, when the economy is tanking, regardless regardless of whether employment is in the mandate or not. And I would be interested to know whether whether that's uh, your view, Tony, as well. Um, You know, we we raised an interesting point that played out in economic history, economic history of thought. I think we sort of settled on the fact, and I could be wrong, I don't know how everyone in the, uh, at this call reacts to this, that we said a simple mandate of an automatic policy is too narrow, and no mandate at all to stabilize the price level is too broad. The tension that we have is we're kind of stuck in the middle as people that are trying to balance these two extremes. And our challenge is a a historical one. Can we demonstrate that we have been reasonably successful in dealing with the middle ground, that is high output price stability, and at the same time allowing ourselves to move against the wind in one direction or another? I think the the Fed has the benefit of uh, over 100 years in a single um, country structure that made the reputation building quicker, if only because it had more time. So it's not really quicker, it's just a longer history. I think the European Central Bank started with a narrower mandate and needed to create that uh, reputation. And I think that reputation is hard fought. But as Kathleen indicates, we live in a political environment where no matter what the question is, there are always vehement agreement and opposition on every topic. It makes the challenge of the central banker that much more difficult to sort of weave between these two extremes and carry out the mandate as is given. It's not easy. And I think that that's where essentially 
Athanasius' view would be the central bank shouldn't care, right? Uh, you well, have... let me let let me qualify that a little bit uh, because it's uh, I, I I agree with what Patrick and and, and Tony highlighted, and I, I want to restate this in. Uh, uh, in the um, in the sense of the proper interpretation of mandates, there are slight variations of mandates of central banks around the world. Um, my preferred uh, among the majors uh, is actually the Bank of Japan's, uh, which is uh, focused on price stability, so as to achieve uh, a good performance of the economy overall. I think this is this is what we know from theory. That, uh, this from monetary theory, and this is what practical central bankers, when they have been operating well, have been doing. They focus on maintaining price stability uh, in the medium term, not because we love price stability, but because this is the best way to promote economic stability and uh, high growth and employment uh, over, uh, over time. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, what Patrick suggested is, is absolutely correct. Uh, um, uh, policy will ease uh, when a recession uh, is, uh, uh, is is a threat, even in the case of the ECB or any other central bank where, uh, where uh, considerations such as uh, maximum employment are not uh, part of the primary mandate. Because in one sense, every central bank has implicitly or explicitly primary or secondary mandate uh, the performance of the of the economy uh, uh, overall the interpretation of the mandate is important however because in some cases the fed is like that in my view can create tensions that need to be explained to the public so what is the fed's mandate fed's mandate is to promote effectively the goals of i'm quoting here maximum employment, comma, stable prices, comma, and moderate long-term interest rates. In my view, this was interpreted very nicely when Tony was on the FOMC and for and for years uh, before. Uh, I, I recall Chair Greenspan having, uh, uh, having a speech where he highlighted the focus is on price stability because this is how the Fed can contribute to the sustainable growth that the Fed associates with uh, with price stability. More recently, the Fed changes tune in in a, in a manner that I think is not helping uh, the Fed. Uh, the Fed started in around 2012, also stressing maximum employment as part of the goals, and this actually highlights a short term tension that is counterproductive. And in my view, is one of the tensions that resulted uh, in the uh, inflation spike uh, policy mistake uh, that we've seen uh, in 2021. Uh, and, and yet, you know, is it is it, uh, it is it is this better to highlight uh, those two objectives, maximum employment, stable prices, instead of what uh, the committee was doing when when Tony was on the committee, saying we focus on price stability in order to to justify more. I, I think that I think the earlier uh, the earlier framework was better in the sense that the central bank was transparently explaining the constraints and the fact that a strict interpretation of the mandate that politicians may write down because it sounds good may always be, be feasible. I will also highlight another tension. If you were to promote a strict interpretation of the mandate, then uh, I would have wanted to have the Fed also talk about what it's doing to ensure that long-term interest rates are moderate. The Fed has avoided talking about that while it chose to highlight uh, maximum employment uh, as a mandate. People refer to a dual mandate in the case of the Fed, but as a matter of fact, it's not really dual. There are three objectives in the mandate that, and, and, the, and the central bank in this case should be explaining to the public that one of them actually is the dominant objective in order to achieve the other two. Maintaining price stability for the Fed also contributes to high employment, also contributes to moderate long-term interest rates. This is the language that I think would be more useful. So this is the case for the Fed. Different central banks have to deal with this thing differently. In the case of the ECB, for example, as Patrick noted, out, noted earlier, price stability is the primary objective. But it's not the only objective subject to that. There are a number of other secondary objectives, uh, including uh, climate change. I want to come back to that. Unfortunately, that formulation is not helpful. 
in those secondary objectives of the ACB, one finds things in addition to environmental sustainability, this is where the climate change comes in, such as the promotion of technical advance, solidarity amongst people and nations, and full employment. And it's so many secondary objectives that it's impossible for the ACB to actually fulfill them uh, all. And this is where the issue of legitimacy comes in. Is it legitimate for the ACB to misuse the legal language and say, look at all, look at all of the discretion we have with all of these objectives. We choose because of our preferences to select one of them and highlight that over others and let's ignore the others. And this is what I think is not constructive for building uh, credibility, for improving the reputation, for strengthening the arguments in favor of, of central bank independence. So you know, what that tells you is that, you know, you get more volatility in the concept of trust. Can, can I chip in something here on the life would, in this area was a lot simpler in the period, which ran, if you like, from, you know, from Paul Volcker from 1980 to 2010, when the interest rate, the short term interest rate was the instrument, the only instrument that was being used effectively by, by central banks. And now so many other instruments are available. And so questions are asked about why are you using which mix? And there's a very concrete example in the last couple of weeks from China, where the People's Bank has been involved in a very large stimulus package. And you might think, well, what did they do? The stimulus package, they probably re reduced the interest rate to zero before they did anything else. That's what, you know, we, we used to think. Well, you, you don't start to think about QE until the interest rate is uh, at the, the lower bound. But they didn't do that. They they did lower their interest rate, which is it's about 1.7, came down to 1.5. But they did a lavish suite of uh, financing of stockbrokers to buy as, uh, equities, other things, which raises questions about what additional distributional effects this company versus that company, this part of society versus that part of society are affected by, by the monetary policy decisions of, of that particular central bank. It's a very concrete example. They made a deliberate choice not to lower the interest rate to zero. They wanted to get the result in a different way, which had different consequences. For example, lowering the interest rate would have damaged bank profitability. So perhaps that was one of the reasons they didn't lower the interest rate uh, closer closer to zero. So I think these it, having a wide range of tools from which you are selecting makes it very difficult to say that you are only having one impact on the and a global impact on the economy. You have a distributional effect affecting one thing rather than another. This brings a, another question as to whether um, the effectiveness of uh, reducing interest rates in certain moment is has been um, eroded and that policymakers, central bankers think that it is important as a result of that to use other tools. Well, we've always asked the question of has monetary policy been neutralized because of changes in the economy? I think the answer is the economy has a uh, an evolutionary process. Our job as central bankers to understand the transmission mechanism and to adjust our actions given the reality of the current transmission mechanism. Um, so when people turn around and say, well, given the changes, monetary policy doesn't work. My reaction is to say, no, it, it just works somewhat differently. And the technical issue is to be able to build the transformation process in a way that allows you to get to your desired outcome by taking different, perhaps different qualitative as well as quantitative steps. So I'm not one that believes that central banking policy doesn't work because of the changes. And I know you didn't say that. Um, but but there are people out there that say, well, given what's going on, let them concentrate on other things. My reaction is central bank is still the central bank and providing liquidity in an appropriate fashion is still the best way to stabilize the economy and to get the price stability. 
I would agree 100% with that. And I think that the um, the experience of the last couple of years, when there's a very dramatic increase in, in policy interest rates in the main uh, central banks, it, it certainly has had that effect, uh, both in terms of the immediate impact, but also in the signal, clear signal it sent to economic agents that the central bank is here to bring inflation back under control and, and it's not afraid to raise interest rates. Okay, you can complain they may have been a few months late, but when they got going, they really got going. So the last word for that is reestablished the the trust, the transparency. Would you agree? I think they have recovered uh, some of the ground lost in, in this particular episode of inflation. Um, I, I like many people, I'm a little bit worried that this might not have gone entirely away. There might be a certain bumpy episode for the next year or two. Uh, nevertheless, I think it, it, it has been uh, a, a recovery, a recovery a, a rather than a, a wonderful performance. So I, 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 I agree with that, but I will, I will add one thought that I have not yet seen. So I think that uh, um, with the uh, uh, rate hikes uh, that we've seen major central banks, uh, including the Fed and the ECB, uh, uh, 22, 23 um, central banks have reestablished some of the lost uh, credibility, but they have not in either case uh, yet uh, explained how going forward uh, they will go back to a frame, a policy framework, ensuring that policy will be systematic and avoid uh, the excessive discretion uh, that has led to, to mistakes in the past. And in my view, central banks will be better positioned to defend their independence going forward if they do that. If they, if they impose constraints for their discretion and explain how they're systematic going forward. And I just add that, look at the Swiss experience in this particular inflation episode. The Swiss came into this, okay, people have complained about this thing and that thing that they've done, but they came in with a very strong uh, price stability reputation. And they have maintained that reputation. You will say, oh, that's because money flowed in uh, to, to the Swiss economy and the currency appreciated. But why did the money flow in? Because of the reputation. And they were able to um, essentially eliminate almost all of the inflation surge. Yeah, except that, you, right, okay. I think, you know, looking at the, <laughs> at the time, it's uh, we are running out of time, actually. So I just want to thank you uh, for these really very, very interesting comments and uh, discussion. And uh, to our viewers, I also want to just remind um, our members that um, on December 3rd, we do have uh, a... Um, uh, uh, I would say an inaugural gathering of the College of Central Bankers in person. And uh, I would invite you to register to that. You can do that on uh, the um, website that we have, independence.org. Um, um, it's December 3rd, and it's followed on December 4th uh, with uh, a partnering uh, with Bloomberg uh, conference uh, in their headquarters. And um, again, looking ahead into next year, we do have uh, an event in uh, Nassau um, at and the University of uh, the Bahamas. So with that, I want to thank you, Athanasios, Tony, and Patrick. And again, congratulations on your book, Patrick. And to the next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.